Okay, uh, first I'd like to thank uh, um, the organizers uh, of uh, Laval Virtual for inviting me. I'd uh, uh, especially like to thank Thierry Olivier, who uh, uh, engineered the connection. <laughs> and, um, and I'd like to thank uh, Maurice for um, uh, helping me make my presentation so much easier. <laughs> um, we are colleagues, uh, you'll see we work in a very uh, parallel space and uh, um, there's no doubt that, uh, that I also share and I think many other uh, artists of our generation also share this uh, sense that somehow or other we are uh, dealing with the, uh, the big questions. Um, and uh, each of us come about, come toward, uh, define what these questions are and come about uh, offering uh, tentative solutions in different ways. Um, now, I've, uh, I've prepared my presentation in the format of, uh, of, of sort of meditation around the topic of future cinema. And I think Maurice mentioned to you that this was also an exhibition that I curated uh, some time ago in, uh, in, uh, at the ZPM, but I also still think it's a very pertinent thing. Um, what is talking about, uh, to some extent, about optical systems and perceptual experiences and about a history of these uh, phenomena. And especially when one is talking about the cinema, one uh, looks back to uh, a, a period when the cinema was being, you could say, invented. And uh, one can be impressed by this enormous range of uh, devices and experiments that were going on at that time. All these bizarre machines that were being developed. And uh, to some extent I feel that we are also now in a time of uh, this, uh, this kind of uh, experimentation. Developing new uh, apparatus and uh, new... Uh, uh, strategies of representation. Now, I'm also going to I'm going to frame my presentation. It's it's largely a presentation of works, uh, and I will frame it in terms of certain themes, uh, certain central themes. Many of these themes again uh, echo um, the uh, presentation that Maurice uh, just made. So, interactivity undoubtedly is one of the uh, the core um, components of uh, what constitutes uh, the new media. And uh, in this presentation, I'll sort of go back and forth between uh, earlier work of mine and more recent work, uh, let's say analog and digital work, but I, I want to just show you uh, a certain uh, pattern of obsessions, uh, in, and for instance, in this case, uh, interactivity, and different strategies for actually achieving um, the result. The result is, in this case, the uh, the, the viewer, the uh, the uh, the um, yeah, the art consumer, becoming uh, an active uh, player, an active participant uh, in the artwork. And here, early experiment with um, a, a projection screen. And as you can see, the proje this projection screen on the right is filled, is a transparent screen filled with white balloons. And uh, each balloon has a tube attached to it, and this tube is going into the audience. And so the audience, are, by blowing in the tube, are inflating or deflating those white balloons. So it's actually the audience that are controlling the shape of the surface on which the projected image appears. Now I'm going to jump forward to a work, uh, The Legible City, um, where the viewer uh, is uh, able to bicycle in cities of text. These cities are based on the ground plans of real cities, uh, Manhattan, Amsterdam, and then later uh, Karlsruhe. Uh, the houses, the buildings, are replaced by letters, and the letters together form words, and these words form sentences. So that as you are bicycling through these virtual cities, you are actually reading the city, reading, reading the, um, the text. Um, there, 
you actually see on this little LCD monitor in front of you, you see the ground plans of, of the actual city, and you see where you are located in that city. And the, 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 let the word sentences together constitute stories, basically narrative. So it's transforming the city architecture into a narrative space uh, that you uh, read as you uh, bicycle around uh, its streets. This, in this work, the in interaction is uh, caused by um, the system reading the, the lines on your hand, and then it takes those lines as a kind of uh, mark, a sort of unique mark of your identity, and it puts those lines into the image space. And you can see other lines which are the history of other people's hand lines. So in a way you connect your hand lines to a history or memory of other people's participation, and you join that sort of uh, a web of, uh, of interactivity. And in the background you see a, a tapestry of, uh, uh, let's say, cellular, cellular um, a sort of cellular tapestry of video clips, which are also refer to different kinds of uh, networks, to uh, social networks, uh, um, uh, traffic networks, uh, electronic networks, biological networks, um, and this is a database of videos which is uh, uh, let's say randomly sampled every time somebody puts their their, ha their new uh, imprint into the system. Now another important thematic is immersion. And again I'll jump back to a, a, an earlier, a, a very early experiment with immersion. This was at the Experimental Film Festival in Knocker in Belgium. Uh, and here the projection screen is not on the wall, but the projection screen is on the floor. It's an inflatable structure. Film and uh, is projected onto that screen, that soft screen on the floor, and uh, both performers and then audience could jump into the screen. So the, the, the viewer is actually jumping into the projection screen and, of course, uh, modulating uh, the shape of the image and at the same time uh, being physically co-present in the, in the image. Now this, let's say, um, conjunction of, uh, of physical presence of the viewer as an immersed presence in the image is also articulated in this work, Heaven's Gate. Uh, there's projection on the ceiling and the floor is a mirror. So the, the visitor, when they look down in the mirror, to, mirror, they see their own reflection, and they see the reflection of the of the uh, of the video image. So their own, let's say, the image of their own body is integrated into the into the space of representation. The actual uh, narrative of this work is a, a very simple, you could say, oscillation between the baroque gaze up to the heavens. So paintings of Baroque, uh, Baroque ceiling paintings of heavenly spaces and satellite pictures looking down onto the planet Earth. And the piece just oscillates between the Baroque gaze up and the contemporary view from uh, satellite view down. And again, in the, uh, in the installation you, you are uh, in a situation where you are sort of suspended between uh, an image that's above you and an image that's uh, below you. And these, let's say, digital uh, trompe-oil-like transitions basically move you between these two um, axes. And this is another work that, that extends, in a way, the, uh, the, the, the paradigm uh, in this work. Um, one is looking uh, simply at, uh, at images of uh, various architectures, various, various ceilings. In fact, this work was commissioned for Lille Cultural Capital of Europe, and the pictures we're seeing are uh, fisheye images taken at different locations in Lille uh, of different buildings, but all kinds of buildings. Uh, 
uh, municipal buildings, um, uh, factory buildings, private houses, shops. Now, this is a cave work. Uh, again, the cave actually offers, as a technology, one of the, the strongest, let's say, means of uh, engaging uh, immersion. And um, I think, again, as, uh, as Maurice clearly uh, showed with his uh, cave work, World Skin, one of the interesting challenges also is to create an uh, interface between the viewer and the cave space of representation. And in this case, uh, this involved building a wooden puppet, uh, a mannequin, with uh, sensors in all its joints, so that when you entered the cave space, you could manipulate, play, dance with the puppet, and uh, those interactions uh, with the puppet um, would modulate uh, the behavior of the visual space. And handling the puppet was, the, was a process of discovering that space. Closing the puppet's eyes would make the room go dark, and then opening the puppet's eyes would take you into another visual space. And you can see here that manipulation of the head, of the hands, have very specific effects. In general, one could say that the puppet is at the center of this virtual universe, and manipulation of the puppet rotating its uh, position in space, uh, moving its head, uh, would change um, its and your point of view in that space. And certain positions of the puppet would trigger very specific events, like this sort of whirlpool of signs, which would trigger just when the puppet was upside down. Another important, uh, let's say, um, component of this uh, field of, uh, of research is uh, the panoramic gaze. Again, it has very strong, it's very much anchored in a history of, uh, of um, representation, panoramic painting, and also in a history of media. This is the Panorama Mesta in The Hague. Uh, a very, very beautiful uh, painting at the beginning of the century, uh, looking out over the, uh, the seaside, it's Haveningen. And of course you have that, uh, the cinema in its, uh, as it uh, has an enormous appetite for extension in space, Cinerama being one of its uh, high points in terms of uh, engaging uh, the audience's sense of immersion. And I'll just show you this as a, as a sort of a, a slight detour. Um, work I did with Genesis for the tour uh, Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. A first attempt to create a continuous panoramic narrative done just with slide projection. At that time it was uh, the only technology that was there allowing this kind of uh, um, large scale um, um, presentation now then moving towards 360 degree panoramic uh, visualization spaces projected environments and also again looking for ways in which narrative can be distributed in a panoramic space um, Again, you'll see, I think, strong pa uh, parallels with uh, Maurice's work, The Retinal Memory. Um, it's everything to do with, somehow or other, in a way, the hyper-realism or the realism of the real world, where we are continuously inhabiting spaces which are just densely filled with narrative, with multiple narrative um, uh, occurrences. And as, uh, as people who exist in this space and move through this space, we are continuously assembling our own personal narrative by choosing where we focus our gaze, 
where we focus our attention. Just simply uh, another illustration of, uh, let's say, the, the, an immersive uh, expression of, uh, of new media. This is uh, simply taking, um, this is a work of uh, Bernd Lintermann at the ZKM, taking um, Google, Google Maps and remapping Google Map as a, a maps as a 360 degree um, Im, uh, immersive experience. Which also includes some social media aspects because uh, this work accesses panoramic photographs which are on the web. So again, this, again, this leads to another very important paradigm and that is that the viewer is no longer a passive spectator, but the viewer in this world becomes both the camera person, becomes also director of what, uh, is, uh, to some, of what is happening and editor. In this particular work, uh, the projector is mounted on a pan and tilt device and there is a sensor on the viewer's head which basically tracks their point of view and that moves the, uh, the window of view so as you move around you're moving the projector and moving that, uh, that viewing window in the space and in this case the space is a, is a complete um, inflatable dome so, so information is distributed uh, throughout this uh, spherical space now this is a work of a, a French artist, uh, artist in residence at ZKM, who used this system to make a work, uh, and you'll see example of this work now. Again, you're moving a window, um, and you're moving it in a narrative space. Again, narrative content is distributed all over the dome and you are basically moving from one uh, uh, one topic to another and this is the the actual database it's a uh, 4k by 4k um, fisheye movie so all the content is embedded in this movie and you're basically moving a window around inside this movie um, also then interesting is the way in which you one hybridizes a linear uh, movie because the movie is uh, 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 a six minute long linear work but uh, the interactive uh, component is the is uh, the let's say the control of the uh, camera window and the uh, and the editing which is given over to the uh, the, the viewer These are other experiments in uh, in creating panoramic uh, uh, visualization spaces. Uh, this was one particular paradigm where you have a 360 degree screen. You have a platform in the middle which is motorized so that you are able to rotate your point of view around. This is the virtual one work called uh, Place Humpy. The virtual world is uh, constituted by cylinders virtual cylinders these were t these were photographed using a stereo panoramic uh, photo camera which en enabled us to create uh, stereo pairs of images So that one basically rotates one's point of view and also can move forwards and backwards in the virtual world. So you're exploring a space populated by cylindrical images. You can enter these cylinders. It's a passive uh, stereo uh, projection system. By grace of projection design. 
you have an LCD screen in front of you which you can rotate and you see buttons which allow you to move forwards and backwards. Again, moving around in this uh, a virtual space of, of, of cylinders, entering, uh, being able to enter a cylinder. In some panoramas there is also uh, a, some animation events. We uh, um, worked with an animation company in Bangalore and created a, a number of uh, representations of Hindu gods and these were then uh, animated and embedded in the, um, in the photographic space. I have to apologize because I haven't connected my audio, so this time around uh, all of these uh, works, or most of the works that I've shown you, are fairly audio-rich as well. And then another, let's say, uh, variation of this 360-degree uh, implementation, which involves complete projection in the full 360 degrees. Now this is a work done with the Wooster Group in, uh, in uh, New York, uh, a very famous uh, theatre company. We built a panoramic video camera. You can see this, uh, this ring of 12 cameras. These, these are each 2 megapixel uh, video camera, so we have a total resolution of 24 mega, uh, uh, gigapixels, sorry, uh, megapixels for the whole uh, video. And you can see the set where the cameras are located uh, on a table and actors are, uh, are sort of performing uh, a piece around. Now this is the actual um, panoramic movie that was shot. It's a half hour performance, there's no editing, it's just performing in front of the cameras for half an hour. The way the piece is presented is in a 360 degree screen and there is one viewer on a chair in the middle of the, uh, of the cylinder and that person controls the movement of a window of uh, sharpness so that most of the image is out of focus, a kind of uh, metaphor for uh, or embodiment of the notion of peripheral vision and the area, that part where you are looking straight ahead, where that person on the chair controls a certain window of view, that's the area which is in focus and of course the audio is being modulated accordingly. So you are hearing, mostly what you are hearing is what's in front of you and, you are, and, that, and the sound of, the, of what's going on uh, uh, with the other actors around you is sort of muted down. So again, it's a, a, a 360 uh, space of uh, distributed narrative, and as a viewer, you can choose where you move in this narrative and how you edit these narrative components together. Okay, now a little intermission while I just uh, move to another um, part of, the, of this presentation. Another th thematic which I'd like to uh, introduce in terms of this, uh, let's say, space of future cinema is the notion of recombinatory aesthetics. Now this also has been explored by many people in many ways, uh, famously by Raymond Queneau in his 100 million million poems, simply uh, a book of poems where every line uh, can be turned independently leading to uh, all these possible combinations, but also remarkable work of uh, William Burroughs, it's one of the very earliest examples of, uh, of video cut-up, where he's actually just assembling uh, bits and pieces of video in a, in a sort of a, in a video cut-up.
So in our 360 degree visualization space, we have another you know, way of approaching this, uh, this possibility of a, of a recombinatory aesthetics. In this work, um, over uh, 30,000 video clips uh, are in a database. Uh, they can be presented uh, on, the, on this 360 degree projection screen up to up to 500 videos can be presented simultaneously but typically we are showing around 250 videos uh, they are also it's a, a, a 3d experience even though the videos themselves are 2d they are distributed in a 3d space so this is the virtual space around the cylinder where all these videos are, are played out And in this work, basically, you can um, click on any video. It will look at the metadata associated with that video. And then look for other video clips which it thinks are similar. And assemble those video clips around the one you've chosen. But at the same time, uh, behind you, it will show the opposite. So it will show both, you could say, the uh, synonyms and antonyms. Both... Uh, the, uh, those things which match what, which uh, most closely match what you ask for, and those things which are uh, um, most, uh, let's say, uh, opposite to what you ask for. And then, once you have this this spectrum of images on the screen, you can then drag and drop these images and assemble them uh, into sequences. Um, all the video data is from broadcast television, so it's just taking, you could say. TV um, trash and recycling that trash uh, as a sort of Lego box, a sort of you could say narrative Lego blocks, which um, the, the the viewer can then reassemble into some kind of emergent narrative experience. Now again, this is uh, another work of Jean-Michel Bruyère uh, using uh, this particular environment and also picking up on that notion of a space of, um, let's say, um, a density of uh, video data. But in this case, the video data uh, is constituted by his own personal archive of uh, video creation. And you will see that he's uh, embodied this in a completely different uh, atmosphere. Um, and again, you see all kinds of interesting aesthetic conjunctions. Uh, uh, this certainly will remind you of Maurice's uh, uh, tunneling experiments. So this is a, um, a kind of roller coaster ride through some kind of uh, organism where, this, uh, where um, video clips are textured to the surface of this... Uh, In terms of, of coding, there are a number of sort of generative aspects to this work because uh, it's uh, it has a number of different, uh, let's say, um, algorithmic parameters. So that uh, choice of videos, uh, speed of movement, uh, shape of the environment is continuously being, um, you could say, uh, almost randomly modulated. So uh, interesting thing about this work is that. It, it is always changing. You will never see the same, you'll never have exactly the same uh, image uh, twice. Now, of course, our new our future cinema is very much addressing, is very much to do with addressing the senses. I'll show you just a couple of examples of experiments in this direction. This is a work of Tamas uh, Valitsky, which I uh, cooperated on. Uh, it uses a motion platform. It's an extremely simple piece. It's just uh, interactively driving your point of view through an infinite forest, a forest which extends in all directions, up, down, left, right, 
you can never leave this forest, whichever direction you go. And uh, you are on a motion platform so that you are kinesthetically engaged in this experience of actually floating through this, uh, this uh, um, infinite forest. Another, of course, uh, core theme and one which you, I think a lot of you are very familiar with is the, uh, the notion of augment, augmentation of the real, which also means, which also includes the augmentation of the virtual. Uh, the whole interplay of the real and the virtual and the, let's say, the paradoxical or ambiguous relationship between the two. Uh, on the left, I show you an earlier work of mine in that, again, in that uh, time of working with inflatables and slide projection, cloud of day sky at night. And on the right, of course, we see this seminal moment when um, Ivan Sutherland uh, invented uh, the uh, head mounted display. Um, I'll just briefly show you this work, Viewpoint. It was shown uh, in Paris. Uh, uh, for uh, the Biennale in 1975 and it is an optical viewing system that attempts indeed to create the conjunction of real and virtual reality but albeit no video projectors, no computers, no very uh, not much technology around in 1975 so this is using slide projection just uh, let's say automatic automated slide projection but what's happening here is that um, I think I have to walk over to actually put it on the draw it. That rectangle is a projection screen, and um, when you look through this optical device, you are looking at this projection screen and you see images projected on that screen. So that image of myself with the pickaxe is the slide projected image. And as you can see, the slide incorporates the image of the window and the image of the room. So from the point of view of the viewer, there is a continuity, a spatial continuity between the real space and the virtual space, the virtual space being basically a reproduction or a, a, phot a photography of the real space, but at a different time. And actually what you would watch if you, uh, if you saw this piece is me walking towards the window with this uh, pickaxe and, sm and breaking the window. Now these people are real visitors to the museum and actually they can see nothing. They don't see anything on the screen. For them the screen is blank. It's only through the optical system that you see the conjunction of the real world, real people moving around in the real space and the projected imagery. And this is done by grace of technology invented, I believe, during the Second World War or by the film industry, basically as a way of... Um, of uh, um, it's called uh, using retro-reflective uh, pro uh, uh, projection material. Now, of course, once computers come on the scene, uh, there are other ways of doing this. And this, again, uses an optical system with a half mirror where you can rotate the monitor and tilt the monitor and look out into a real space and see virtual objects overlaid in the real space as sort of ghosts. And then this is another incarnation of this uh, strategy, a work done for La Villette uh, in 1987 which uses a kind of a, a, a periscope uh, which you can rotate. So it's again a work that deals with panoramic imagery and you can discover virtual images floating in the real museum space. Again, other people do, uh, walking around the space do not see this. You, you only experience this looking through the optical system. The work is called Inventer la Terre because the images which are being projected are, uh, you could say, archaic uh, scientific images. So this device is a kind of um, a, an ar a memory, a, a sort of memory machine or archive of, uh, of ghosts 
of, uh, let's say, uh, previous sciences, uh, which have now been, of course, uh, replaced by our contemporary uh, scientific worldview. So this is actually uh, uh, this is a this is your it's, you could say the, the, the panoramic space where you choose certain topics, and uh, you can uh, by rotating the pa the uh, periscope you can visit these different uh, locations. And now again playing with this uh, paradoxical relationship of real and virtual, an early experiment with augmented reality, uh, a monitor with a tracking device, and uh, you could look back at this uh, pedestal and discover, standing on the pedestal, a golden calf. And of course, by moving the monitor around in space, you could view that golden calf from different points of view. And if you looked closely, you could also see that the skin of the golden calf, which was a kind of, was very reflective, was also mirroring the real room in which you were in. So this virtual golden calf, which was not there and was there on the screen, was actually reflecting the actual space which you were in. Of course, this was done by taking photographs of the real space beforehand and using these as reflection maps on the skin of the golden calf. Now this same, um, let's say, um, paradigm was then adapted for this work, the panoramic navigator. Again, video camera at the top, looking around in the real space, and then uh, adding um, and being able to touch on areas in the real space and get information about that space. So this was like a, a, a guiding system for people who entered the building. They could look around in the space, identify certain areas that looked interesting. They could also rotate the ground plan of the building, go to different floors at the same viewing angle. And I think um, we also had a camera up on the roof. So you could also, from the ground floor, rotate your point of view from the roof of the building. Now this is a very recent incarnation of the same principle, uh, and very practically uh, applied. Uh, a screen with a camera behind it, looking around. The museum is just full of, of objects, full of, uh, of these uh, creatures. You can touch on any one of them as you move the device around or tilt it and then you get uh, information about that particular creature. And this device also allows you to download uh, uh, onto your iPhone and uh, keep a record of your uh, visit. Which leads, of course, to the topic of mixed reality. I'll show you one experiment uh, at Humpy. Uh, there are lots of monkeys, and there is also uh, a... Uh, Hampi is also considered in the Ramayana to be the kingdom of the apes, the kingdom of Hanuman, the monkey god. So we did a, a, an experiment where we actually... Uh, you saw earlier an example of uh, that uh, dancer, Shiva, dancing in the, uh, in the uh, photographic environment. Here we have these, let's say... Um, slightly mythological monkeys, uh, but these are real-time creatures. Uh, we have a tracking system in, in, this, in the, in the uh, area where we can track people's movement in the space, so we can understand where they are. The red one is a real person, and the uh, blue one is a virtual person that's following that person around. This is just to demonstrate the, uh, the functionality of the system. So as a result of that, we first um, motion captured uh, an actor uh, to create certain, uh, let's say, monkey behaviors. And then we have a group of monkeys who have certain, you say, behavioral characteristics. And this is a, 
that's a real person moving around in the space. And you can see as that person gets close to those monkeys, they become aware of that person's presence and react accordingly. So there are certain behaviors of, of curiosity, of, of anxiety, of nervousness, of panic, which are triggered by simply the, uh, the, um, the sensing of the um, proximity of a viewer to those uh, characters. And this is another situation where you have a virtual tourist and a real visitor approaches the tourist. The tourist recognizes that somebody is nearby, then talks to that person and says, would you like to be in my movie? Takes their virtual camera, does a recording of the real person who's standing in front of them. And then shows that person the movie that was just made by this virtual character of them actually watching them. So again, this conjunction of uh, real and virtual uh, spaces. Now this is a machine, it's, uh, it's the machine itself is, uh, we call it reactor, it's a six-sided back projection environment. And uh, it's a, a stereoscopic uh, a projection system, and uh, it allows you to create, you could say, a virtual space, which the viewer can walk around and look into from six different points of view. Now, one work that we created uh, for this is based on a text of Samuel Beckett called The Lost Ones, and he describes a community of people that are incarcerated in an enclosed space. Now in this particular work you have a community of virtual humans and you view them by moving a, a torch and moving a virtual torch light inside that space. And again six people can view this community from six different points of view and there are six torch beams which they are manipulating to view them. Those characters, again, are based on the, uh, the Beckett text, so their appearance and their behavior follows uh, the, uh, the narrative of that text. So one is moving the torch, there, is a, uh, there are sensors which are measuring its, its angle of view. Now another aspect is that you can actually point the torch directly in front of you, and you will actually see the other person, you will illuminate the other person who is on the other side of the virtual space. So you not only can view the virtual characters, but you can actually view the real person who's on the other side of the, uh, of the screen. And if somebody later wants to ask me how it's done, I'm happy to explain. Again, being able to point the torch straight through and this is just, uh, actually it's, it's a mapping of the uh, narrative space. It shows the logic of the different uh, behavior pot uh, possibilities for the different characters and how they interact with each other. And once that's put in place, then, the whole, then a game engine basically keeps the whole thing uh, playing and being continuously uh, improvised. It's a somewhat uh, dystopian work. You could say the human race at the end of time. Now this is just a virtual, um, it just basically gives you a kind of a, a, a representation of how the piece is uh, actually uh, constructed. Now, uh, this is the last uh, work, the last sequence of pieces I want to show you, and it's, uh, it just focuses on a certain area of uh, research and, uh, and artistic activity, which I and colleagues are very uh, closely involved with at the moment, in the field of digital humanities and digital cultural heritage. Um, 
Now I've got five minutes left, but it'll take me about ten minutes, okay? So I'll just prepare everybody for this time frame. <coughs> we have a lab in Hong Kong called the Applied Laboratory for Interactive Visualization and Embodiment, where a lot of these machineries are set up and where a lot of this uh, research and experimentation is taking place. And these are the, uh, the, the apparatuses that we're working with, the 360 degree projection systems, dome projection, hemispherical projection, uh, half cave projection, and this uh, six-sided uh, reactor. Now here's a work uh, in relation to uh, archaeological work being done uh, on, the, on tombs in mainland China. So um, tombs are continuously being discovered. Uh, they are being laser scanned, uh, photographed, and we are taking this uh, laser scan data and, photo and, photograph and photography and creating uh, let's say virtual reconstruction of this space inside a 360 degree 3D projection environment and also a situation where you can click on certain painterly details and zoom in and look at them uh, close up. Now, more recently, a, a much more, a much bigger, more ambitious work is done together with the Dunhuang Academy in China. Uh, there is an extraordinary site there, the, uh, the uh, Mogao Grottoes, hundreds of caves, uh, painted over a period of uh, 1400 years, uh, every cave absolutely exceptionally beautifully painted, uh, under enormous threat of, uh, of sort of, uh, uh, of let's say, uh, environmental damage, and uh, so big issues to do with long term sustainability. So, uh, our, our, uh, our system basically offers uh, people the opportunity to select different caves which they would like to visit virtually in this kind of cave browser environment. Each one of these pictures is a, is a, represents one or other possible cave, but currently we've only um, we're only working with a data set from one cave, uh, so we only have a prototype uh, demonstration which just works with uh, one particular cave, Cave 220, this one. This is the cave. These are, this is the, the painting on the north wall. So we, with this data, of course, in a virtual space, you can do this incredibly powerful zooming on, on detail. Much more, I mean, if you were actually visiting the cave, this, this gives you more power of, uh, of, uh, of visualization, of viewing, than you have in the real cave. And also experiments, obviously, with uh, uh, recoloring, uh, because, of course, a lot of these paintings are, have been exposed to wear and tear over time. So, recoloring and also to uh, enhance, let's say, the, uh, the didactic experience for a general public, uh, adding certain animated uh, component animations to the image. A very important iconographic feature are these uh, Buddhas and their uh, canopies. These have been, again, repainted, again, under the supervision of academics from the Dunhuang Academy. And here we see the repainted uh, uh, images popping out of the painting. And again, using the magnifying glass to be able to view this. In the painting,
painting, there are musical instruments, being able to bring up the musical instruments as 3D objects, and also listen to them. There is, there is a soundtrack attached to this where you hear worked with dancers from the uh, Beijing uh, Dance Academy to recreate one of the dancers that are in the painting uh, using uh, a 3D uh, um, uh, rig. Another project involves uh, a very famous uh, Buddhist canon in Korea, the Tripit Tripitaka Koreana. Again, hundreds of wood blocks. There is a, a quite famous uh, Korean scholar, um, Bu uh, Buddhist scholar, uh, Professor Lou Lancaster, who has developed a kind of digital humanity strategy of uh, interrogating these texts by converting all the characters into blue dots. And then looking at these arrays of dots and then identifying certain characters and giving them colors and then looking for patterns in this array of dots. Now currently his only, let's say, viewing, uh, let's say, environment for this is a, uh, a monitor screen and we are actually experimenting with taking this uh, massive, uh, let's say, visual database and putting it into a 360 degree immersive environment so that basically you can uh, interrogate these, uh, what were once wood blocks, inside this, uh, this uh, cylindrical space. We're also working with the Europeana and this is just a sketch for a, uh, a current project looking at using an a iPad as an interface to, uh, again, interrogating uh, large data, cultural data sets. So looking at, uh, especially in a 360 degree environment, looking at strategies for multi-user engagement. This is a work done uh, recently in Turkey, uh, and I'm just going to show you quickly some uh, experiments in, uh, in panoramic uh, video uh, recording as another very powerful tool in terms of, uh, of uh, cultural heritage uh, documentation.